Book 22 Death in the Great Hall Now shrugging off his rags, the wiliest fighter of the islands leapt and stood on the broad door sill, his own bow in his hand. He poured out at his feet a rain of arrows from the quiver and spoke to the crowd. So much for that. Your clean-cut game is over. Now watch me hit a target that no man has hit before, if I can make this shot. Help me, Apollo. He drew to his fist the cruel head of an arrow for Antinous, just as the young man leaned to lift his beautiful drinking cup, embossed, two-handled, golden. The cup was in his fingers, the wine was even at his lips. And did he dream of death? How could he? In that revelry amid his throng of friends, who would imagine a single foe, though a strong foe indeed, could dare to bring death's pain on him and darkness on his eyes? Odysseus's arrow hit him under the chin and punched up to the feathers through his throat. Backward and down he went, letting the wine cup fall from his shocked hand. Like pipes, his nostrils jetted crimson runnels, a river of mortal red, and one last kick upset his table, knocking the bread and meat to soak in dusty blood. Now as they craned to see their champion where he lay, the suitors jostled in uproar down the hall, everyone on his feet. Wildly they turned and scanned the walls in the long room for arms, but not a shield, not a good ashen spear was there for a man to take and throw. All they could do was yell in outrage at Odysseus. Foul to shoot at a man, that was your last shot. Your own throat will be slit for this. Our finest lad is down, you killed the best on Ithaca. Buzzards will tear your eyes out. For they imagined, as they wished, that it was a wild shot, an unintended killing. Fools not to comprehend they were already in the grip of death. But glaring under his brows, Odysseus answered, You yellow dogs, you thought I'd never make it home from the land of Troy. You took my house to plunder, twisted my maids to serve your beds. You dared bid for my wife while I was still alive. Contempt was all you had for the gods who rule wide heaven. Contempt for what men say of you hereafter. Your last hour has come. You die in blood. As they all took this in, sickly green fear pulled at their entrails, and their eyes flickered, looking for some hatch or hideaway from death. Eurymachus alone could speak. He said, If you are Odysseus of Ithaca, come back. All that you say these men have done is true. Rash actions, many here, more in the countryside. But here lies the man who caused them all. Antinous was the ringleader. He whipped us on to do these things. He cared less for a marriage than for the power Cronion has denied him as king of Ithaca. For that, he tried to trap your son and would have killed him. He is dead now and has his portion. Spare your own people. As for ourselves, we'll make restitution of wine and meat consumed and add each one a tithe of twenty oxen with gifts of bronze and gold to warm your heart. Meanwhile, we cannot blame you for your anger. Odysseus glowered under his black brows and said, Not for the whole treasure of your fathers, all you enjoy, lands, flocks, or any gold, Put up by others would I hold my hand. There will be killing till the score is paid. You forced yourselves upon this house. Fight your way out, or run for it, if you think you'll escape death. I doubt one man of you skins by. They felt their knees fail and their hearts, but heard Eurymachus for the last time rallying them. Friends, he said, the man is implacable. Now that he's got his hands on bow and quiver, he'll shoot from the big doorstone there until he kills us to the last man. Fight, I say, let's remember the joy of it. Swords out, hold up your tables to deflect his arrows. After me, everyone, rush him where he stands. If we can budge him from the door, if we can pass into the town, we'll call out men to chase him. This fellow with his bow will shoot no more. He drew his own sword as he spoke, a broadsword of fine bronze, honed like a razor on either edge. Then, crying hoarse and loud, he hurled himself at Odysseus. But the kingly man let fly an arrow at that instant and the quivering feathered butt sprang to the nipple of his breast as the barb stuck in his liver. The bright broadsword clanged down. He lurched and fell aside, pitching across his table. His cup, his bread and meat were spilt and scattered far and wide, and his head slammed on the ground. Revulsion, anguish in his heart, with both feet kicking out. He downed his chair while the shrouding wave of mist closed on his eyes. Amphinomus now came running at Odysseus, broadsword naked in his hand. He thought to make the great soldier give way at the door, but with a spear throw from behind, Telemachus hit him between the shoulders, and the lance head drove clear through his chest. 
he left his feet and fell forward, thudding forehead against the ground. Telemachus swerved around him, leaving the long dark spear planted in Amphinomus. If he paused to yank it out, someone might jump him from behind or cut him down with a sword at the moment he bent over. So he ran, ran from the tables to his father's side and halted, panting, saying, Father, let me bring you a shield and spear, a pair of spears, a helmet. I can arm on the run myself. I'll give outfits to Eumaeus and this cowherd. Better to have equipment, said Odysseus. Run, then, while I hold them off with arrows, as long as the arrows last. When all are gone, if I'm alone, they can dislodge me. Quick upon his father's word, Telemachus ran to the room where spears and armor lay. He caught up four light shields, four pairs of spears, four helms of war high-plumed with flowing manes, and ran back loaded down to his father's side. He was the first to pull a helmet on and slide his bare arm in a buckler strap. The servants armed themselves, and all three took their stand beside the master of battle. While he had arrows, he aimed and shot, and every shot brought down one of his huddling enemies. But when all barbs had flown from the bowman's fist, he leaned his bow in the bright entryway beside the door and armed. A four-ply shield hard on his shoulder and a crested helm, horse-tailed, nodding stormy upon his head. Then took his tough and bronze-shod spears. The suitors who held their feet, no longer under bowshot, could see a window high in a recess of the wall, a vent, lighting the passage to the storeroom. This passage had one entry with a door at the edge of the great hall's threshold, just outside. Odysseus told the swineherd to stand over and guard this door and passage. As he did so, a suitor named Agelaus asked the others, Who will get a leg up on that window and run to alarm the town? One sharp attack and this fellow will never shoot again. His answer came from the goat herd Melanthius. No chance, my lord. The exit into the courtyard is too near them, too narrow. One good man could hold that portal against a crowd. No, let me scale the wall and bring your arms out of the storage chamber. Odysseus and his son put them indoors, I'm sure of it, not outside. The goatish goat herd clambered up the wall, toes in the chinks, and slipped through to the storeroom. Twelve light shields, twelve spears he took, and twelve thick-crested helms, and handed all down quickly to the suitors. Odysseus, when he saw his adversaries girded and capped, and long spears in their hands shaken at him, felt his knees go slack, his heart sink, for the fight was turning grim. He spoke rapidly to his son. Telemachus, one of the serving women, is tipping the scales against us in this fight, or maybe Melanthius. But sharp and clear, Telemachus said, It is my own fault, father, mine alone. The storeroom door. I left it wide open. They were more alert than I. Eumaeus, go and lock that door, and bring back word if a woman is doing this, or Melanthius, Dolius's son. More likely he. Even as they conferred, Melanthius entered the storeroom for a second load, and the swineherd at the passage entry saw him. He cried out to his lord, Son of Laertes, Odysseus, master mariner and soldier, there he goes, the monkey as we thought, there he goes into the storeroom. Let me hear your will. Put a spear through him, I hope I am the stronger, or drag him here to pay for his foul tricks against your house. Odysseus said, Telemachus and I will keep these gentlemen in hall for all their urge to leave. You two go throw him into the storeroom, wrench his arms and legs behind him, lash his hands and feet to a plank and hoist him up to the roof beams. Let him live on there, suffering at his leisure. The two men heard him with appreciation and ducked into the passage. Melanthius, rummaging in the chamber, could not hear them as they came up, nor could he see them freeze like posts on either side the door. He turned back with a handsome crested helmet in one hand, in the other an old shield coated with dust, a shield Laertes bore soldiering in his youth. It had lain there for years, and the seams on strap and grip had rotted away. As Melanthius came out, the two men sprang, jerked him backward by the hair, and threw him. Hands and feet they tied with a cutting cord behind him, so his bones ground in their sockets, just as Laertes' royal son commanded. Then, with a whip of rope, they hoisted him in agony up a pillar to the beams, and, O oh my swineherd, you were the one to say, Watch through the night up there, Melanthius. An airy bed is what you need. You'll be awake to see the primrose dawn when she goes glowing from the streams of ocean to mount her golden throne. No oversleeping the hour for driving goats to feed the suitors. They stooped for helm and shield and left him there, contorted in his brutal sling, and shut the doors and went to join Odysseus, whose mind moved through the combat now to come. Breathing deep and snorting hard, they stood, four at the entry, facing two score men. But now into the gracious doorway stepped Zeus's daughter, Athena. She wore the guise of Mentor, and Odysseus appealed to her in joy. O oh, Mentor, join me in this fight. Remember how all my life I've been devoted to you, friend of my youth. For he guessed it was Athena, hope of soldiers. 
Cries came from the suitors, and Agelaus, Damastus' son, called out, Mentor, don't let Odysseus lead you astray to fight against us on his side. Think twice, we are resolved, and we will do it. After we kill them, father and son, you too will have your throat slit for your pains if you make trouble for us here. It means your life, your life, and cutting throats will not be all. Whatever wealth you have at home or elsewhere will mingle with Odysseus's wealth. Your sons will be turned out, your wife and daughters banished from the town of Ithaca. Athena's anger grew like a storm wind as he spoke, until she flashed out at Odysseus. Ah, oh, what a falling off! Where is your valour? Where is the iron hand that fought at Troy for Helen, Pearl of Kings, no respite and nine years of war? How many foes your hand brought down in bloody play of spears? What stratagem but yours took Priam's town? How is it now that on your own door sill, before the harriers of your wife, you curse your luck not to be stronger? Come here, cousin, stand by me, and you'll see action. In the enemy's teeth, learn how Mentor, son of Alcimus, repays fair dealing. For all her fighting words, she gave no overpowering aid, not yet. Father and son must prove their mettle still. Into the smoky air under the roof, the goddess merely darted to perch on a blackened beam, no figure to be seen now but a swallow. Command of the suitors had fallen to Agelaus. With him were Eurynomus, Amphimedon, Demoptolemus, Pisandrus, Polybus, the best of the lot who stood to fight for their lives after the streaking arrows down the rest. Agelaus rallied them with his plan of battle. Friends, our killer has come to the end of his rope, and much good mentor did him, that blowhard dropping in. Look, only four are left to fight in the light there at the door. No scattering of shots, men, no throwing away good spears. We six will aim a volley at Odysseus alone, and may Zeus grant us the glory of a hit. If he goes down, the others are no problem. At his command, then, ho, they all let fly as one man. But Athena spoiled their shots. One hit the doorpost of the hall, another stuck in the door's thick timbering. Still others rang on the stone wall, shivering hafts of ash. Seeing his men unscathed, royal Odysseus gave the word for action. Now I say, friends, the time is overdue to let them have it. Battle spoil they want from our dead bodies, to add to all they plundered here before. Taking aim over the steadied lanceheads, they all let fly together. Odysseus killed Demoptolemus. Telemachus killed Eurydes, the swineherd Elatus, and Pisandrus went down before the cowherd. As these lay dying, biting the central floor, their friends gave way and broke for the inner wall. The four attackers followed up with a rush to take spears from the fallen men. Reforming, the suitors threw again with all their strength, but Athena turned their shots, or all but two. One hit a doorpost in the hall, another stuck in the door's thick timbering. Still others rang on the stone wall, shivering hafts of ash. Amphimedon's point bloodied Telemachus's wrist, a superficial wound, and Catasippus's long spear, passing over Eumaeus's shield, grazed his shoulder, hurtled on and fell. No matter. With Odysseus the great soldier, the wounded threw again, and Odysseus, raider of cities, struck Eurydamus down. Telemachus hit Amphimedon, and the swineherd shot killed Polybus. But Catasippus, who had last evening thrown a cow's hoof at Odysseus, got the cowherd's heavy cast full in the chest, and dying heard him say, you arrogant, joking bastard! Clown, will you, like a fool, and parade your wit? Leave jesting to the gods who do it better. This will repay your cow's foot courtesy to a great wanderer come home. The master of the black herds had answered Catasippus. Odysseus, lunging at close quarters, put a spear through Agelaus, Damastor's son. Telemachus hit Leocritus from behind and pierced him, kidney to diaphragm. Speared off his feet, he fell face downward on the ground. At this moment, that unmanning thundercloud, the Aegis, Athena's shield, took form aloft in the great hall, and the suitors, mad with fear at her great sign, stampeded like stung cattle by a river when the dread shimmering gadfly strikes in summer, in the flowering season, in the long-drawn days. After them the attackers wheeled, as terrible as falcons from Eries in the mountains, veering over and diving down with talons wide unsheathed on flights of birds, who cower down the sky in shoots and bursts along the valley. But the pouncing falcons grip their prey, no frantic wing avails, and farmers love to watch those beaked hunters. So these now fell upon the suitors in that hall, turning, turning to strike and strike again, while torn men moaned at death, and blood ran smoking over the whole floor. Now there was one who turned and threw himself at Odysseus's knees, 
Leodes, begging for his life. Mercy, mercy on a suppliant, Odysseus. Never by word or act of mine, I swear, was any woman troubled here. I told the rest to put an end to it. They would not listen, would not keep their hands from brutishness. And now they are all dying like dogs for it. I had no part in what they did. My part was visionary, reading the smoke of sacrifice. Scruples go unrewarded if I die. The shrewd fighter frowned over him and said, You were diviner to this crowd. How often you must have prayed my sweet day of return would never come, or not for years, and prayed to have my dear wife and beget children on her. No plea like yours could save you from this hard bed of death. Death it shall be. He picked up Agileus's broadsword from where it lay, flung by the slain man, and gave Leodes' neck a lopping blow so that his head went down to mouth in dust. One more who had avoided furious death was the son of Terpis, Phemius the minstrel, singer by compulsion to the suitors. He stood now with his harp holy and clear in the wall's recess, under the window, wondering if he should flee that way to the courtyard altar, sanctuary of Zeus, the enclosure god. Thigh bones in hundreds had been offered there by Laertes and Odysseus. No, he thought, the more direct way would be best, to go humbly to his lord, but first, to save his murmuring instrument, he laid it down carefully between the wine bowl and a chair. Then he betook himself to Lord Odysseus, clung hard to his knees, and said, Mercy, mercy on a suppliant, Odysseus. My gift is song for men and for the gods undying. My death will be remorse for you hereafter. No one taught me. Deep in my mind a god shaped all the various ways of life in song. And I am fit to make verse in your company as in the gods. Put aside lust for blood, your own dear son Telemachus can tell you, never by my own will or for love did I feast here or sing amid the suitors. They were too strong, too many, they compelled me. Telemachus, in the elation of battle, heard him. He at once called to his father. Wait, that one is innocent, don't hurt him. And we should let our herald live, Medon. He cared for me from boyhood. Where is he? Has he been killed already by Felicius or by the swineherd? Else he got an arrow in that first gale of bowshots down the room. Now this came to the ears of prudent Medon, under the chair where he had gone to earth, pulling a new flayed bull's hide over him. Quiet he lay while blinding death passed by. Now heaving out from under, he scrambled for Telemachus's knees and said, Here I am, dear prince, but rest your spear. Tell your great father not to see in me a suitor for the sword's edge, one of those who laughed at you and ruined his property. The lord of all the tricks of war surveyed this fugitive and smiled. He said, Courage. My son has dug you out and saved you. Take it to heart and pass the word along. Fair dealing brings more profit in the end. Now leave this room. Go and sit down outdoors where there's no carnage in the court, you and the poet with his many voices, while I attend to certain chores inside. At this the two men stirred and picked their way to the door and out and sat down at the altar, looking around with wincing eyes as though the sword's edge hovered still. And Odysseus looked around him, narrow-eyed, for any others who had lain hidden, while death's black fury passed. In blood and dust he saw that crowd all fallen, many and many slain. Think of a catch that fishermen haul into a half-moon bay in a fine-meshed net from the white caps of the sea, how all are poured out on the sand in throes for the salt sea, twitching their cold lives away in Helios's fiery air. So lay the suitors, heaped on one another. Odysseus at length said to his son, Go, tell old nurse I'll have a word with her. What's to be done now weighs on my mind. Telemachus knocked at the women's door and called. Eurycleia, come out here. Move, old woman, you kept your eye on all our servant girls. Jump, my father is here and wants to see you. His call brought no reply. Only the doors were opened and she came. Telemachus led her forward. In the shadowy hall, full of dead men, she found his father, spattered and caked with blood like a mountain lion, when he is gorged upon an ox, his kill, with hot blood glistening over his whole chest, smeared on his jaws, baleful and terrifying. Even so, in crimsoned was Odysseus, up to his thighs and armpits. As she gazed, from all the corpses to the bloody man, she raised her head to cry over his triumph, but felt his grip upon her, checking her. Said the great soldier then, Rejoice inwardly, no crowing aloud, old woman. To glory over slain men is no piety. Destiny and the gods' will vanquished these and their own hardness. They respected no one, good or bad, who came their way. For this and folly a bad end befell them. Your part is now to tell me of the women, those who dishonoured me, 
and the innocent. His own old nurse, Eurycleia, said, I will then. Child, you know you'll have the truth from me. Fifty, all told, they are, your female slaves, trained by your lady and myself in service, wool carding and the rest of it, and taught to be submissive. Twelve went bad, flouting me, flouting Penelope too. Telemachus being barely grown, his mother would never let him rule the serving women. But you must let me go to her lighted rooms and tell her, some god sent her a drift of sleep. But in reply the great tactician said, Not yet. Do not awake her. Tell those women who were the suitor's harlots to come here. She went back on this mission through his hall. Then he called Telemachus to his side and the two herdsmen. Sharply Odysseus said, These dead must be disposed of first of all. Direct the women. Tables and chairs will be scrubbed with sponges, rinsed and rinsed again. When our great room is fresh and put in order, take them outside, these women, between the roundhouse and the palisade, and hack them with your sword blades till you cut the life out of them, and every thought of sweet Aphrodite under the rotting suitors when they lay down in secret. As he spoke, here came the women in a bunch, all wailing, soft tears on their cheeks. They fell to work, to lug the corpses out into the courtyard, under the gateway, propping one against the other, as Odysseus ordered, for he himself stood over them. In fear, these women bore the cold weight of the dead. The next thing was to scrub off chairs and tables and rinse them down. Telemachus and the herdsmen scraped the packed earth floor with hose, but made the women carry out all blood and mire. When the great room was cleaned up once again, at sword point they forced them out, between the roundhouse and the palisade, pell-mell, to huddle in that dead end without exit. Telemachus, who knew his mind, said curtly, I would not give the clean death of a beast to trulls who made a mockery of my mother, and of me too, you sluts who lay with suitors. He tied one end of a hawser to a pillar and passed the other about the roundhouse top, taking the slack up so that no one's toes could touch the ground. They would be hung like doves or larks in springes, triggered in a thicket where the birds think to rest, a cruel nesting. So now in turn each woman thrust her head into a noose and swung, yanked high in air, to perish there most piteously. Their feet danced for a little, but not long. From storeroom to the court they brought Melanthius, chopped with swords to cut his nose and ears off, pulled off his genitals to feed the dogs, and raging hacked his hands and feet away. As their own hands and feet called for a washing, they went indoors to Odysseus again. Their work was done. He told Eurycleia, Bring me brimstone and a brazier, medicinal fumes to purify my hall. Then tell Penelope to come and bring her maids. All servants round the house must be called in. His own old nurse, Eurycleia, replied, Aye, surely that is well said, child, but let me find you a good clean shirt and cloak and dress you. You must not wrap your shoulders' breadth again in rags in your own hall. That would be shameful. Odysseus answered, let me have the fire. The first thing is to purify this place. With no more chat, Eurycleia obeyed and fetched out fire and brimstone. Cleansing fumes he sent through court and hall and storage chamber. Then the old woman hurried off again to the women's quarters to announce her news, and all the servants came now, bearing torches in twilight, crowding to embrace Odysseus, taking his hands to kiss, his head and shoulders while he stood there, nodding to everyone, and overcome by longing and by tears.